everybody? This is Drex One. Welcome to another episode of the History of the Bay podcast, sponsored by the good people of Amoeba Music San Francisco. Go see them on Hay Street. Support your local record stores. Also got to shout out the folks at Dying Breeze San Francisco, where you can get custom gear and all your graffiti supplies. Today, behind the lens, we got King Said. On the boards, we got D.O. And today, of course, we got another special guest. All our guests are legendary. This one is no exception. If you haven't heard of him by now, you've definitely been living under a rock. <laughs> He's been doing his thing. It's undeniable that he has made history in a short period of time. Come on. Promoted himself probably like no other artist in the Bay Possibly like no other artist in hip hop. Huh? He, he's put out original music, thought provoking content, always staying true to himself, including his fans and his friends and his family and everything he does. And of course, I'm talking about the one and only La Russell. Come on, that was special. Come that on, was yeah, great. Right on, right on, right on, right. I've been trying. I've been trying to work yeah. on my intros, man. You that know? was great. <laughs> Well, I uh, appreciate you reaching out and making this happen. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the platform. Um, you've been doing your thing. Of course, I've been aware of that for a minute. And uh, so it's it's dope to have you here to share your story, man. Man, mutual. Um, I like, I seldomly reach out to be on something. Like, I usually get like a request that somebody asks. So this was uh, one of the first ones in a long time that I seen and I was like, I want to do that one. You feel me? And I was like, why them niggas ain't hit me? <laughs> but no, I'm excited for this one. I've been seeing the content and it's been fire. And I'm like, bro, this is special. This is what we need. Thank you, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sure we would have... I'm not. I'm, I guarantee we would have reached out eventually had you not beat us to it. But uh, yeah, I get that a lot from a lot of people. Like, how come they hit me up? But you did the right thing, which come is, on. man, come on. Sometimes just extend the hands, extend up, exactly. extend the branch, and see exactly. what happens, man. And also, I got to give you uh, your props too, because like you said, I noticed you do a lot of people's podcasts, a lot of people's platforms, and I think it's dope that you make yourself accessible to the to the greater community out here in the Bay. Come on, yes, man! Sir. I love that shit. I love that shit. Like we were just talking in the car. Uh, I be, I opened up the door for people to just like book me direct because mm -hmm. I'm like I don't like waiting on like the fest and the shows. It's like bro, I'm gonna go straight to the people. And man, I've been getting I've been getting booked to just come chill with niggas for you know amounts that I would get to do a show and just even the lowest shit. It's like bro, I really opened the door for everybody to be able to get access to my level of stardom or success that I've accumulated to the world. And that shit's been special as fuck because we doing shit that you just don't... Usually when you get to a certain level as a rapper or as an artist, everything changes. But like being able to do shit like that, bro, just keep it so human. I think that's a very Bay Area thing. It's something I brought up on the podcast before that level of accessibility. You know, me growing up in Frisco, I done seen rap cats at the taqueria, at the right. gas station. Just knowing that you can reach out and, and touch somebody goes a long way. That too cool for school type of shit, uh, that kind of bites you in the ass in the end. But when you really make time to build with people, that's how you really build a uh, fan base and supporters who are really invested man. in it. Because they're like, man, this dude just came out on, on the strength. Real man. community. Exactly. Exactly. Right? exactly. 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 <laughs> so I always start at the beginning. But I'm gonna switch it up just slightly <laughs> for this for this interview, and I want to ask you. You know, we've actually had a long run of uh, guests from Vallejo on the podcast, so I'm not gonna ask you what Vallejo was like, but I will ask you what kind of impact did Vallejo have on you in terms of your perspective and the way you see your music in the rest of the world. I mean, in its entirety, like <laughs> when you growing up. You you summon yourself, summon your mom, summon your father, and the rest is your environment. And I've been in Vallejo just about my entire life since I was four. So the music that I consumed and the clothes I seen niggas wearing and the the way niggas talk, the salt, everything is from Vallejo. Like in a lineage of Vallejo rappers, if you listen to my songs and certain shit I say, it's like, it's very clear I'm a Vallejo rapper, but I've also expanded my palette beyond too. But it's 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 just everything. I am Vallejo. <laughs> I, like that. I like that. Yeah, Vallejo is sick, man. Uh, there's, there's so much versatility 
Right. I mean, you could go, obviously, you got the great like E-40 in the click. You got Mac Dre. Yeah. And everybody else coming out of the crash. You got Into Deep. You got Baby Bash. You got Selly Cell. Yeah. And then uh, in later years, you got the S-O-B-R-B-E cast. Yeah. You got Neff the Pharaoh. Yeah. And now you're creating your own chapter, but it's still like a chapter in the book of Vallejo, right? Right. Her. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Her. Shout out to her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was your first exposure to hip hop that you remember? Damn. I don't have, I don't remember like my first exposure, but I have a few key hip hop moments in my life that made me like, wow, I love this. Um, my mama used to always watch the concert doc for the Up, Up and Smoke tour, the uh, Dre, Dr. Dre 2001. Hell yeah. And I used to just be in the living room and seeing them niggas perform. And it's this part on there where they start flashing their titties. And nigga, as a kid, I was like, I want to rap. <laughs> <laughs> I want to rap. Um, man, and prior to that, like, we, we just had a lot of music in the house. Like, you know... We hip hop kids. Like I used to wear G Unit gear from top bottom shoes. You mm-hmm. know, like like we we just a hip hop family and crib. Uh, we used to watch 106, all the BET awards. I remember an award show it was a BET award, and Lil John and the Yin Yang Twins closed it out. It was another moment. Like wow, you feel me? So for me, I don't remember the inception. I just remember these. Occurring moments in my life that's that hip hop led, you know, all the parties, there's certain songs that just it did it, made the whole house is up, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. I talked to to older artists who remember when hip hop first came out, mm-hmm. but I think people from uh, our generation or even slightly older, slightly younger, like growing up with hip hop. Is, yeah. is special because it's linked to so many memories and moments from your childhood. It's something that you just always had, right? Right, because it's like some of the older generation, like their parents didn't even play it. it. You know, it was like it got to them. But it's, I don't remember a time in life where, you know, I haven't been hearing hip hop. That's been a predominant genre in my life. Well, let's break it down a little deeper. What, what was your first exposure to Bay Area hip hop? Inception, car seat, <laughs> car seat. My mama was the biggest Too Short fan in the, my whole family from Oakland. Mm-hmm. And she was the biggest Too Short fan in the world. I, I grew up Too Short, delinquent, three times crazy. You know, like the list drew down, the list go on. Everything Bay Area hip hop was in the truck. Everything else was like secondary music. You feel me? That's what my pops and my mom slapped. Dope. I'm going I'm to ask you this. This is the second time I've asked this on a podcast, but I'm, I'm just, I'm genuinely interested to know. Come on. Who are La Russell's top five Bay Area rappers? Man, every time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, it changes every time I get asked it, but um, Dre, 40, me, Nefta Farrell, the boy. Wow. Yeah. Is that all Vallejo? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look like, hold right. on. As right. you put yourself on that list, which I'm not mad at, do you, do you genuinely, I'm not asking this to um, provoke or, or cast doubts. Do you genuinely believe that in the time that you've been active, you have made it to that level? Definitely. Definitely. I believe I am one of the greatest rappers to ever come out of the Bay. Um, not even like cockily, like just it's all it's all out there, you know, to be this and you feel me? I feel like that's my and that's the love I get. Like I move around the bay a lot. I'm out, I just had to come to Oakland uh last week to get a birth certificate and I'm just I'm walking on the street and the whole time, huh? No, uh, uh, you know, like I get the feeling and that energy of that existence of that spirit. But I, I truly feel, you know, I grew up listening to everything that came out the region and all of it was so impactful. But I feel like my impact in the Bay has been so different. And just the spirit 
that moves through the people when we active and when my name is brought up and when we do things, it's just, it's a different energy and spirit. So yeah, I definitely feel like I should be, I, I'm number one on that list to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm number with no, no disrespect or disdain at all. I love our greats, but I, I feel like that's uh, my rightful position, you know? It did not come off as cocky. Let me and, kill this really quick. No, you good. Oh, this is my dad. Hold on, hold mm-hmm. on, really quick. Yo, what's happening? Nah, I'm doing this uh, interview, The History of the Bay. All right, bet. I'll hit you after. Is it emergency? Bet. All right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, no, it, it, didn't, it didn't come off as cocky. Uh, my follow-up question, you kind of answered it. It was going to be, what is the criteria for that? And if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like the impact you have on on the people. Yeah, I think um, I think impact is the sole criteria. Mm. Before you get to like skill and songwriting and all, impact is the sole criteria because it's beyond music at that point. Like when when people, I get people who come to shows or who love La Russell or who buy my product who the music isn't their primary way of finding La Russell. They know La Russell through helping out at Momo's Cafe. They know La Russell through giving it. They know La Russell from talking to this older lady and giving the gym or, you know, so I think impact is high on that criteria list in terms of how was the world impacted off of your presence? Not just your music, not just niggas dancing or whatever, but how are people impacted off of someone mentioning you and bringing up what you do? Um, so I feel like that's the highest on the list. And then it goes to skill set. And then it goes to slaps. It's like, okay, can you rap? How good of, of of an artist are you? And then it's like, are you making songs that niggas fucking with that, you know, people want to hear? And I feel like just gradually through my career to this point, I've been checking off all those boxes. Man, I like this brother's confidence, man. <laughs> I can't be mad at that at all, man. If you mad at that, you a hater straight up, man. You, hey, and it be niggas mad at it. Oh, I know. And they, but, they, but you know what? They stay watching right now. Right, right. They watching right now, man. Like, damn it. They're like, he mentioned me. <laughs> exactly. He's he got a shout me. out. He got some free promo, baby. Right, I love it. Um, wow, man. So that's the trip. Yeah, I mean, we, we'll get into this more later. But yeah, I, 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 I can't disagree with what you just said. I mean, your your fan base is uh, highly dedicated. And Come I on. think that speaks to like what you said, the impact. And I always say this, too, is like the uh, music is subjective, right? How good it is, how, you know, right. but the way it makes you feel, the way it makes people feel, I think... Uh, you're right. That's definitely more important than like how many words you can rhyme or, you know, how fast you can rap or. You and, you know. know, the feeling, the music is subjective. The feeling isn't. I go places. Right. I get off that right. stage right. and it's a 60 year old white woman coming up right. to me. I, I, I can't believe, you know, right. like that is undeniable mm-hmm. whether you like the song or not. Mm-hmm. You know, that 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 part isn't subjective and. We experienced that shit. That's the important part of the music. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. That, that is completely objective, man. What's up, everybody? Just want to take one quick second away from the episode to let y'all know that the History of the Bay podcast is available for promotional opportunities. That includes advertising, product placement, music reviews, if you want to promote your music and content creation. So we can create some original content for your product, for your service, for your business, for your music, and have it promoted in the middle of episodes on the podcast, just like we're doing right now. If you're interested, shoot us an email, historyofthebay at gmail.com. Now playing on my YouTube channel, The Fogumentary, a behind-the-scenes documentary about my process of creating music that covers the entire Frisco rap scene, talks about graffiti, talks about that genuine, unique Frisco culture that we're known for, and it's all based around this album right here, Fog Mode. 
I be seeing comments sometimes on some of my videos like, oh, I didn't know Dregs rapped. I didn't know he made music. I didn't know this. This is a real close look at my journey and my process. And there's some dope stuff in here that you probably didn't know. And it's all related to this album right here, Fog Mode, which I dropped in 2021. And it's featuring Andre Nicotina, Black Sia, RBL Posse, San Quinn, Stunner Man 02, and many more. So if you're a fan of Bay Area rap, make sure that you check out this album. I got CDs available for the collectors. The link is in the description. And check out the Fogumentary, now playing on YouTube. Now, let's get back to the episode. Well, what what who do you, what, what are your like your influences in terms of your rhyme style and your approach to crafting music? Everybody. Every time I hear a beat, I hear certain artists and then I hear myself. Like there's some pockets you will hear I kind of sound like Dre, but I also sound a lot like La Russell, so you can't you like, he clearly is influenced by Dre, but it doesn't sound like I'm mimicking. But everybody, like, outside of hip-hop, just any, once I hear beat, it really takes me, you know, to, that shit could go from fucking Green Day to <laughs> Dre, you know? Like, it just, it's expansive. I'm influenced by everything I hear. Mm-hmm. And what, what was your entry to actually becoming an artist, picking up a pen, getting into the studio? Um, when I was younger, me and my sister used to always, like, write songs over songs that was already done. Like, we'd put the CD in a boombox and just write our own verses mm-hmm. and rap over that shit, download the instrumentals on LimeWire. So, that was kind of inception. And just all throughout my life, um, I found a way to rap. Like, when I was young, my best friends would come and we'd end up writing a rap. So, so somehow, we'd end up there. And in middle school... One of my best friends, Larry, had got a laptop for like Christmas or some shit. And we downloaded this program called Acid Pro. Oh, yeah. We used to come over after school. Niggas used to get up in there and just start recording songs. Actually, before Acid Pro was after, I started using FL and making beats prior to that. And we started making hella beats. And it was like, ain't nobody gonna rap on these. You feel me? So we'll rap on them. And I remember going to the flea market, San Jose flea market with my pops, and I got a microphone. And I thought it was like the coldest shit in the world. It was like, with this, <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, it's it's been so many phases. But since a youngin', I've been writing rap probably since like six, seven years old. And what was the first entry into putting those out for other people to hear? I recorded a song. When, uh, my best friend's dad had a studio. Um He's uh he called it Black Dragon Entertainment. And we went over there and he let us record and he showed me how to like enunciate my words and oh, this an overdub, this a little like just kind of taught me basics. And he burned it to a CD after. Mm-hmm. Nigga, straight home, planning. And it's like, bro, when you can hear yourself on a CD on a record, and it's funny because back then I wasn't even like hella proud of what I was doing. Like I would play it low, you know. And then I remember early, my cousin, I got a cousin named P-Town, and um, I used to make beats. And I seen him beats, and he rapped over one, burned it to the disc and sent it back. And that was like the first time me hearing the artist over some shit I made. And I remember um, I was probably in like middle school. They had like a little picnic in the V at like Dan Foley or some shit, uh, Richardson Park, one of those. And uh, he took me with him. And uh, it was rapping Fote. Mm. And a group, uh, I think that was called like the Jungle Boys or something. And I was a young nigga, and they just had like a cypher at the end with Plan B and Fote and all the young niggas. And I like, my heart was beating, but I got like the energy to rap. And I just rapped some quick shit. And you know, since I was a little nigga, everybody like, ah, <laughs> you feel me? And um, yeah, it just grew. It's just been moments throughout like that that solidified it for me. But I never, um, it's crazy, the whole time I never was like, I'm going to make it as a rapper. I just really like to rap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's important, too. You, you know, you actually got to love this shit before it can you become got your to. career. But in terms of like, so you talking about burning CDs. Was there a point where you like, I'm finna sell these CDs? Or was that era already passed? Where you like, 
Doing when I was tapes to online. Man, nah, we was burning. Had every CD I made. Uh-huh. We were burn, spending the whole night going through the burn uh-huh. towers, getting them. Nigga, press a label on them bitches. Like, my pop showed me the whole operation. Our shit was legit. Put them holes in the sleeve and, and gone. I never sold them, though. Hmm. Never. Always gave them away since high school. Every mixtape I met, even when I got to my first album, Field Effect, I had never sold them. I used to just give them away. They was just promo for me. And that first album, um, when did that come out? 2018 was okay. like my first album. Like, world, I'm giving some, but I, I was dropping mixtapes throughout high school. Okay. And what were you doing uh, outside of rap for like careers and stuff? Um, UPS, mm-hmm. FedEx. Worked at a winery for a bit, and then I got, um, I started working at this aerospace plant, moved around the flow, and then worked up and got to go on the admin side, and I quit from there. Like, that was my last job. So you were there for for a minute? I was there for probably about five years, from from like 2013 to 2014 to 2019. And while you're working, those are all good jobs, right? Uh, I think I've heard you say this before. I've said it before. Ain't nothing wrong with having a a job. They (laughs) weren't. It wasn't good. They were jobs. It was jobs. It was a yeah. paycheck. It was paycheck. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a paycheck. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what I was getting at is you're doing that while you're recording and mixing. I was doing that more than I was recording and putting out music, honestly. Then, like, I was doing it intertwined, but like I said, that whole time, man, I just started working because I had a, a child when I was 17. Okay. And and I was like, that was beating my ass. And it was like, you know, you go to work, you got to go to work so you can take care. So I was kind of working more than I was working, yeah. you know, on my crafting shit for a while. And it slowly kept, I always was doing it in the background though. Weekend, I get off work, I'll try to get something in. And then I just slowly start doing it more and more because the passion start growing. I start writing things I love. Just I just start getting more adamant into it. But yeah, the whole time I was working a job in the early times, just that's what was funding everything. And that's why I wanted to ask you that too, because I think a lot of people get discouraged when shit don't happen right away. Right. And a lot of <clears throat> stories that you hear, they almost seem like they do happen right away from the outside looking in. It's like, oh yeah, I went to the studio. I'm Made a song, I put it on SoundCloud, and it blew up. And but that's not everybody's story. No. <laughs> Why? Even though you know you got to pay bills, it, that's something I think everybody can relate to too. Is like right. a, a lot of people don't take off right away because of financial limitations. Let's keep it funky too. We're in the Bay Area, man. We it's a lot of people we competing against. They able to put money from certain sources into to fund what they doing. You know, right. talk about it, salute to the. I ain't mad at that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> What, aside from that, was there something that you ha- changed that you that was different back then that you had to was it a, was there a confidence issue was it was it a perseverance issue was it a focus issue organization issue all of the above okay I was in development mm-hmm. I was in development I mean I was just a human growing and as you grow your priorities shift a bit the things you care about the things that matter to you shift a little bit. So now I was just developing that entire time. And um, the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it because the more I was able to see how possible it was. And that was always the issue. I just, I just never did it enough to see the results I wanted to see. I was never not going to make it but I just didn't do it enough to see the results I wanted to see. So I was telling myself, I, you know, it won't happen. But it's like once I started doing things and it's like, damn, I did that and this happened. Damn, I did that and this happened. And it just keeps on compounding. It's impossible to get to that point at that point because you can see the road. Let's break down what you just said, Russell, because I, I don't even know if you, you're aware of some of the powerful things you just said. <laughs> You just talked, you said, you told yourself it wasn't going to happen. I've been there. I think we've all been there where you're like, ah, fuck. I just, right. especially now that things are like compressed to to numbers and views and likes. Man, it's harder. And streams. You're like, man, I only got 800 streams. Fuck, this shit ain't going to happen. You always in comparison today. Comparison, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And But I believe telling yourself it's not going to happen is one of the most harmful things you can do. For certain. Mm-hmm. For certain, like, 
for certain because niggas believe themselves. Even liars believe themselves. Oh, they, so they it's believe like, themselves don't, the most. You know, it's like, bro, that, man, we was just talking about it in a car. I was having this whole rant because I was like, for me to do as much as I do, I be talking down on myself sometimes in a way that just doesn't make any sense. But I've been... Throughout my journey, I've conditioned myself to utilize that as fuel, which is crazy because um, there's two ways to to there's two ways to end a war: conquer or embrace, right? And most people choose conquer, and a lot of us choose like that dominating side. Like I try to just through growing up, you know, you try to talk you talk yourself negatively into getting that strength instead of positively, and we're just having that convo in the car, and it's like. Niggas ain't trying to do that no more because it never worked. T, T, uh, T had told us the other day, she was like, um, if bullying yourself into being successful worked, then you'd be there already. Yeah. It would have been done, right? If talking negative about yourself was the way to success, you would have already did it. Yeah. You feel me? So, But it takes a lot to get to a point where you could turn that off. I succeeded. You know, like I've got into a point I never believed I'd get to and it still be on for me. So I I, I know when, when niggas down and, and hurting and the paper ain't right, like, it's easy to get into that space, but the only way to get out of that space is to get out of that space. Yeah, man. I mean, this shit comes with a lot of L's. <laughs> it comes with a lot of L's. A lot of lessons. A lot of lessons, yes. And the other thing you just said right now, which you kind of already touched back on, is this idea that I discovered later in my life um, that you actually, you have to go all in for this shit to, to really work. I kind of compare it to like, you know, like I said, it's dope to have a job while your other stuff uh, is, is is still in development. Like you said, it's dope to do other things. It's dope to have experiences. But when you really decide this is it, Man. I'm finna do this shit. Man. I gotta do this shit. There ain't no other option. I'm putting everything to the side. I'm going all in. It's kind of like if you want to become a doctor, man, like how many years of med school? Damn near 10 years you of med school. You gotta commit to that. You gotta commit to that. You can't be like, I'm finna be a doctor. And you can't and stop halfway school. or you can't yeah, be you, like. Exactly. And you can't you can't just stop and then pick it back up. And then, you know, you gotta, you got you can't do two jobs at once. It's just like, mm-hmm. no, it's, I'm doing this med school shit. Right. It's kind of the same thing, I believe, with, with the music or any type of creative career. You know, what's crazy though, it's only that for some of us to get to the level that we are like, no, that's to, like, nigga, you won. That's what it takes. But a lot of niggas get in <laughs> without any of that. Sure. Without that desire, without that commitment, without that dedication, right? But the thing is, when you, you have to always remind yourself that your path and your journey different. Because when you start looking over there, you're going to be feeling away. Yeah. You're going to be feeling away because... Nigga, I didn't, I be having moments where I'm just like, damn, I still got to work this hard? Like, with all the talent and the skill and the shit that I've done, called the back, all the shit, I still be like, no fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> right? But I know my journey is so much different. My mountain is higher. Some people is like, we're walking at the same pace, but they already at the top of their mountain. And I'm like, damn. Niggas at the people that's like, my mountain all the way up fucking here, so of course I'm having to climb way longer. But when you don't have that perspective and you just looking at another nigga with his flag on the hill, that shit'll bother you. Yeah, it looks different for everybody. Right? And uh, they say that comparison is the thief of joy. Man. And especially now, that's all we do is compare ourselves by, we just scroll. Boy, take everything from you. Yeah. Yeah, you can go, you go on Spotify to play someone's music and you're like, damn, you got how many million streams? And my shit came out the same time. And Man. Th- right? But so when, when uh, if I'm recalling your story correctly, shit really started to pop for you when you got serious about creating content. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I when I got serious about releasing content, Okay, what's the difference? Because I was always creating content. Like mm-hmm. I've been having little, little. Um, I've been having sub viral moments since like 2019, 2018 through different shit I've written and content I shot. But me getting serious about making content and dropping it every day and sharing something every day—that's when it start rolling. Because mm-hmm. you just can't be. 
It's 30 days in a month. A nigga you supposed once a week. Yeah. That's four chances in 30 days you have to change your life. Yeah. I got to the point where I was posting five times a day. I gave myself 150 chances every single month. It's 12 months in a year. That's over 1,500. Mm-hmm. Like, you see a nigga over 1,500 times in a year, somebody gonna know your name yeah. versus the nigga who you only seen 48. You know, so when I got serious about just putting shit out there, it, you know, I be... I'll be working on shit and sometimes I'll just, I'll sit it and I'm going into this space now where um, everything got to be fresh for me. As so I got to, I make the song, we got to go through the content and I got to let it out. I like, even when songs is made for me two, three months ago, it feel old today because right. I didn't did so much shit and I feel so different. Like I just want shit to be fresh. So I just been trying to get into a, a different space. But when I got into this space and embraced just sharing, embraced sharing and being creative and like, let me just make the art I want to art and I want to make and put it out. That's when everything started changing. Was there a specific moment that brought you to that conclusion of like, I got to do this shit every day? My pops. Yeah. We, we've been having just conversations about this shit since the inception. And he's just helped me throughout this entire journey navigate, you know, and I, I always bring shit to him. And uh, we had a conversation one day and he like, nigga, you need to drop every day. Mm. You need to drop something on their ass every day. You got it. That's all he used to say. You got it. Why? Where, it's not like you got to go out your way because you got it. Nigga got 30, 40, 20. Back then I only had like six of them, but I had it, you know. And he like, drop that shit every day. Why would you not? And, you know, I used to be like, nah, because people going to get annoyed. I don't know. That. And it's like, so? Yeah. Some people will, and they'll change the channel. But the people who fuck with your show finna watch every season. Mm-hmm. Diligently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like that uh, uh, all the time, man. Like, if I lose followers, for example, which everybody does. Everyone does. Every single day, you're going to gain some and yes. lose some. Or if every now and then you'll get some weirdo like, I'm unsubscribing, or I don't like this anymore. I'll just be like... <laughs> Thanks for, you know, thanks for joining us. Man, I love it now. Like, I every month, it's funny, I'll go look at that threshold of, like, loss and gain. It's like, I actually need to post and share that because it's like, people don't understand. Like, that's a, every day you lose, but I gain more than I lose, yeah. you know? And it's like, everybody not going to love what you doing. Some niggas start following in 2018 and I was doing different shit and a different nigga. Yeah, they exactly. liked it then, they don't exactly. like it now. And that's okay, you know? Mm-hmm. You can't let that stunt your growth. Mm-hmm. Well, there's also going to, when you really build a core fan base, there's going to be some people who are just like, I don't give a fuck what he does. I'm fucking with it. I mean, he could post 10 times a day. I, I don't care. I'm down and, with this and dude. And it's doing. like, those are the people who truly fuck with you. Yeah. And that's what I had to learn. Like, the, it seems <laughs> more mo money, more problems. Like, the bigger I got, I've never seen so many hate niggas on my page. And it's not even. Still, it's way more love, but today I be sometimes like me and Tiff be talking like, where do these niggas come from, and why? Like, why are you even here? What is, I don't understand the purpose that you chose to to build your home here. You know, I be asking niggas, are they okay at home? Yeah, because it's like, why? What are you doing this for? I don't understand it, and I've I've never had this much. But I'm realizing like, oh, I'm breaking barriers. It's niggas seeing me who ain't asked to see me. Mm-hmm. You ain't got no choice, nigga. Mm-hmm. I put that shit out. Mm-hmm. You feel me? And that's why it's there. It, it landed in their world and they wasn't even supposed to be exposed to it. But that's how big it's getting. So I'm just embracing it. But man, the bigger you get, the more you got to deal with. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to protect your mentals. But, you know, I, 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 I start worrying when they get quiet. I'm like, why ain't nobody talking shit in my notifications right. today? I was, Where y'all shit. at? <laughs> we gotta Where get to work. At? Right. But what, so was it that first, I feel like you might have posted about this recently. Um, it was that, was it that clip of you rapping in the back of the truck that really kind of broke through? And, and, no, no, that okay. was, that was like the, that was one of them. Mm-hmm. All of my shit, all of my shit being stairs. I ain't had nothing. There's just you jump. All my shit just been stare, stare, stare. The first one was the 2021 freestyle. I had a um, we was working out one of my friends' shop, and we just set up. It was like this flower wall. We set up a table in front of. I set up the mic so it looked like a radio freestyle. Wrap mm-hmm. that shit. That shit went viral. Start moving. 
Wallow posted it. Russ seen it. Johnny shot. It just, that opened the door for all the calls, all the me, all the shit, right? And then we kept on going. I ended up having a, another one with Baggy Slam in the back of the truck. That motherfucker just started yanking. Everybody was slapping that shit. And then I had the moment I had performed. Russ brought me out in Berkeley and I did like the hopscot shit. It's like a, a fucking uh, a gift till this day. But I did that shit viral. And just it's just been constant. I constantly been producing moments. And even before those, shit, before the freestyle, do that little dance. I had this live session I did. It was like a blue box. That shit went. And then I started doing the live sessions for other artists. And hell of those went viral. So it's just been moment after moment that really that grew into the point to where every time I have a moment now, niggas like, oh, that's the nigga from this. And yeah. now you've got a new memory. And the consistency of that is crazy because you're talking 2021 and now it's 2024 and you're still creating Man, we just like we just got our silver award for YouTube, like 100K subscribers. That shit took me 1,700 videos. Yeah. It's at 18 now. That was when we got, you know, it was 1,700 videos. That's how much a nigga had to put that shit out. It's a lot of fucking work, people. Yeah. Don't 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 play don't play around <laughs> with this man. He's yeah. working. Right. Uh, it ain't no luck. And then also too, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think that our, our conversation was reminding me of it. P- things that people go through is, and what I noticed doing my own thing, I could throw something up that I'm like, oh, this is hard. This yeah. they finna love this. This finna go, and it's just like one, one, one. <laughs> 200 likes, right. you know, you're like, damn, what the fuck? And then you throw something else up, you're like, eh, whatever, I don't, I'll just try it. And then it just goes crazy. Man. Do you feel, do you agree that, like, you never really know? And then also, are there, do you have times where you put something out that doesn't perform like you expected? And is that something yeah. that you have to just push through? All the time. You, I never really know, but I know. Like, there's certain pieces where we just know. Like, we had a piece, the one with Hit Boy and uh, Storm the Bars. He dancing and shit. That shit, a million players. Like, when you see shit like that, it's fresh. That yeah. reminded, you know, you just know. But some, yeah, some that I think is it, it don't be it. But lately, I've been hitting because we've been making shit that make us all smile. And, like, we be in a room like, nigga, if it make me feel like that, I know it's going to make somebody else who fuck with me feel like that, you know? But sometimes, yeah, you don't know what it hit. I used to tell T, uh, we used to be scheduling posts, and I'd be like, nah, I don't really like that shit no more. And that shit would go up. Yeah. <laughs> you feel me? And yeah, the ones we'd be hyper excited about might not. And you got to just, I learned to not, I'm I'm getting out of the space of judging the art or gauging it, you know, like, because, nigga, if you was thirsty and it was water, you would never be like, oh. It's only this much in it. Yeah. You be like, nigga, <laughs> right. thank God there's that much there. Like 200 likes more than zero is great. Right. 200 likes or 200 niggas. If you went in the middle of a room and 200 niggas was around you, you'd be like, this is a great outcome. Yeah. But for some reason, when we look at socials, we like, ah, oh, that ain't nothing. Nigga, if all them niggas was in one room, you'd yeah. be celebrating. That's yeah. a great thing. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think that's good for people to hear, man, because people get so discouraged. Off, off numbers. Like yeah. And man, it's because they use it so much. Like, I be walking away from conversations and deals sometimes because they start mentioning numbers. Like, oh, well, the Mentioning stream, your the, numbers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, nigga, did you see my numbers five years ago? Did you see them three years ago? A hundred, a thousand x nigga. So it's like, it don't matter what the number is right now. It was a point Drake didn't sell no albums. Yeah. You can't you can't use that shit as a essence to start business with somebody you think is a lifetime artist and you're like, but the nun, man, get the fuck out of here. I don't never have those conversations with any artist I love that I find. Like I I found Shantae with shoes and lights that she pulled up with one of the artists, and I was like, this is the greatest shit ever. She probably had like two, three hundred followers at that point. Still, don't let me get this at. Come shoot this. I'm finna send you over. Still. Now she had 26,000. Nobody give a fuck about no numbers. It's like, do you love it? And do you, huh? She had 33,000 <laughs> now. We've been running Imagine, putting that content out. Mm-hmm. You feel me? But it's like, imagine if I would have been like, ah, oh, I can't help you because you, the numbers ain't there. Yeah, it's crazy. You niggas is weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's like the industry <sighs> built the game in a way to where niggas is scared to take risks because they going to lose their job if their numbers ain't right for this period of time. But it's like, bro, you don't know what... 
I know what my shit gonna be in 10 years. So I, it's like, what it is right now ain't even, man, stop playing. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about something controversial. What do you think about people faking numbers? Buying streams, buying views, <laughs> buying followers. Um, I don't, I know why they do it. I felt that way before. I've been to a point where I'm looking left and I'm looking right and I'm so dissatisfied with what's on my plate. I'm like, man, I'm just going to... Let me find a nigga. I'll pay him. Let me see the difference. Mm -hmm. And that shit don't do nothing but hinder you. I tried to do the fake stream shit before and um, it fucked up my data. Compromised my data. I hurt myself trying to look bigger. How so? Explain Nigga, all the the streams that you get don't come from actual, like, it come from locations, but now I can't tell where my real fans at Uh, when I need to go on tour and where the niggas who just the fake streams at. Like, you compromising your data for a look. It ain't even worth it. So it's like, if you doing it, you know, it's funny because early on, still now too, but early on, they was doing like the streaming form shit to, um, persuade the algorithm to move in a certain way because the algorithm will see that a song is getting hella streams and then start dumping it into algorithmic playlists, right? And I think that shit still work today, but they it's a lot more detected. But that's used to be the game then. You know, they figured out that cheat code to to beat the system to put the songs in their favor. And um, man, bro, yeah, I've been in that space where I was feeling so down about my shit. I'm like, I'm going to just cheat. But I don't, I can't feel good about winning if I cheated. And, and it's going to be the same for them niggas. That's why you see these niggas who got half a billion fucking streams and it's like, where's the tickets? Yeah. Why nobody coming out? You at home and you can't sell out a show. Oof. Like you, it, it don't, that that look ain't worth how it's going to feel. But I also understand when, when I was coming in, Stretch told me, he said, nigga, the streams fake, the this fake, but the money real. Yeah, and in the industry, the nigga who who doing a quota like they just trying to get to the money. That's all they care about. But you know, I had a great ass talk with Tunji from Def Jam, and I asked him about all the streams. I'm like, what's up with that though? Like, are y'all doing it? Mm. And he gave me. We had a real candid convo, and he was like, me personally in my organization, no, because it don't make sense for me. Why would I spend money on fake shit when I could spend money and get real shit? Why would I pay for a fake stream when I could, you know, spend the same amount of money and get a real person who might spend a hundred, two hundred dollars with me, right? So he like, for us, it don't make sense. And he was like, within these systems, niggas get fired for doing that. And he was telling me, he's like, man, it's been several occasions where we get the streaming fraud shit, and it's never from the label. It be the artist feeling away. Or they managers from uh, trying to prove to the artist, like, oh, no, I am doing something. He say the detection never come from inside the building. Other buildings maybe, but the building I've been in, every time we catch it, it's not us. God damn. And when he said that, it made me think like, yeah, I've been an artist in that position and predicament where I'm like, damn, I'm going to just do it. You know, and I had got on to it. I only found out the game because, nigga, back in 2019, I used to study all the artists they was breaking data. So every time a new artist would come, I go in the chart metric and I go look up like what playlist they was on, how they was getting their stream, what platforms they was on so I could reach out. I start looking into the playlist data and nigga be on a playlist and then get a bunch of streams and then the playlist would disappear in 10, 15 days. Mm -hmm. So I start going behind. I type in the playlist. It'll always be an email in it. Go email. Y'all, I'm trying to do that. And they'll send you back a deck. Oh, this how much? And I was like, huh. Crack the algorithm, though. Pay your way in to yeah. get the algorithm to get to real people. Yep. And they still do it today. Like, if I run up a video with a bunch of fake views and you go on YouTube and see my video got a million views, you're going to be like, damn, why yeah. everybody watching? Right, and right. it start leading to the real right. shit. So it's like, I get the game, but man, bro, you're not going to feel good, good winning if you cheated. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be getting that most most points scored in a game trophy and be in your heart like, I ain't do this shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I've, I've done similar research myself. Um, and I've seen artists, and I look at their uh, top five regions and be like <laughs> Pakistan or Brazil or Australia. So look. But I'll be like, okay, potentially you could... 
you could be the dude in Australia right now. Right. But then how come I go on your IG story and I don't see Australians posting your music every day? I don't mm. see I don't see people tagging you in that. How come you're not getting booked? You got a hundred thousand listeners in Sweden? How come you ain't over there you right know, now? You know what I learned? I, I start going through, right? If you know, you go on chart, chart metric or any data platform, every top artist in the world, from Taylor Swift to Beyonce, the whole top 10, 20, any artist that's majorly a star, all they top, Brazil, Sao Paulo, uh-huh. Brazil, like mm-hmm. in specific cities. Yeah. And um, at first I thought they was faking. So I like ran about a few of the people like, what is this? Why does this only exist with, I remember I was talking to Pink Sweats and I was just helping them with some touring shit. And I went his date and I was like, damn, nigga, Jakarta is one of your top. Like it looks dramatically different mm-hmm. when you're in those systems because they're pushing you globally. But what's happening is like ad dollars. The ad costs way less to run uh, in those places mm-hmm. than it does in America. So, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you feel yeah. me? Like that, that I literally said the same thing because I go on the cities and I'm like, why these niggas never tour there? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's different. Like, that's how you amp exposure. And eventually it leads to the point where that real base does exist. But, bro, it's a whole, it's a system. Well, speaking of, uh, Ad campaigns, that's something that you've been uh, public. You even spoke about running them just briefly just now. What what are some metrics that you look for in a campaign that is that's, that makes it successful to you? Um, I think every ad campaign is successful. Okay. Um, there are some that's like more prominent than others, but I think Anytime I spend a dollar and I get a new fan who could spend a hundred dollars yeah. with me, I succeeded. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> right. But um to initiate an ad campaign, the metric I use is like percent yielded of following. So if I got a million followers and I post a reel and it hit three hundred thousand views, that means I activated thirty percent of my audience. To me, right. that's good enough for me to be like, yeah. I'll run an ad. Yeah. If I hit fifty, so once I initiate that, I choose the amount I run based on that number. Mm. So if I hit thirty percent of my yield, I spend thirty dollars a day for thirty days, seven days, go to thirty, depending. Sometimes all the way throughout the year, if it's a great clip. If it's something that hit a hundred percent of the following, I'm running a hundred dollars a day, seven day, thirty days, and it's just. Hidden. I don't even um so yeah, there's not a metric that say like it's underperforming. Once I hit that metric to get in that game, it's all success for me. Cause I know I'm getting in front of a new person every day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause this interview just for one second, man. Just to I gotta give you your flowers, bro. <laughs> no, for real. Like this man knows his shit. This is our first time meeting. Right. Obviously, I've seen seen your work, but uh I, I always appreciate because I study this shit myself, right? Come like on. we have the conversation before the camera start rolling. I take this shit serious. Right. And, and the results uh speak to that. And I always appreciate when I get around an artist that has taken the time to actually learn this shit, man. man. Some people right? they don't they just want to be in the lab, which is cool. Right. I get it, because this is a lot to learn, a lot to do. But I think right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are watching a 2024 Bay Area independent rap guy, man. I'm going to just say it like that. Like this. Like Tech 9 2.0. This like, I, was, I was going to say Master Come P and, and JT the bigger figure and E40. It's like, that's you cut from that cloth, bro. Come on. It's just the updated version of it for uh, instead of the CDs and the mom and pop stores and the sound it's scans. Now wave. it's on the internet. It's on social media. It's on the streaming services. And uh, you, you've innovated a lot of Cool shit, bro. Come on. So I just, just want to hey, give you a prop. That's man. why I put myself on that list, you know? Like, I, I really feel like I did my due diligence and I did my work. Like, I watched a lot of these greats wiggle and where they got to. And, I, man, I, when I was at 40 Crib, it was like, man, bro, I know that I'm, I'm just climbing this, this ladder to where, like, I see my greats and I'm going. And they chat. They like, nigga. You know, like they see me going even higher than they've seen in a in a certain height because it just looks so different now. Yeah, yeah, man. And and I, I'm not gonna say who, but I recently saw an interview with a younger artist who's very successful. Everybody in this room knows who he is, and he basically was like, "Yeah, I don't promote. I just put my shit up." And I was like, "Damn, that's dope." 
you're very successful, you're making money, but you would be more successful yep. if you did push yourself. And I, yep. I, I, I think to me, when I see something like that, that's like insecurity of being for even at, at a successful level, being afraid to put yourself out. Is this there. artist with a label? No. Wow, the indie. Mm hmm. I might tell you offline, but you know what I'm saying? But what I, what I was getting at is the fact that, like, just seeing how hard you push, I think that that is what artists really need to look at. Man, I want it. Yeah. And, and like, like with some of those artists, like you say, the one who's, like, very successful, what kind of success, right? There's different tiers and levels sure. of success, and they all look different. Like, my, my lineage is... Cole, Kendrick, like, L.A. Reid tells me, like, nigga, this is, you know? So it's like, yo, the that myriad of what success is and how it looks is so different. When you're in the community, how do people feel about you? What is that response, right? It, it all looks different. And to get those, you got to do certain work to get certain achievements and accolades. You feel me? And some people are willing to just... Some people willing to just accept what they get and they like, yeah, this shit cool. And, you know, it don't bother them to keep doing the same thing because they comfortable there. But I was never comfortable at those spots. I yeah. always just, yeah. it was always something more for me. Yeah, man. I mean, me being from, from Frisco, being from the Bay, I used to be content with, with a whole lot of little. Man. Like, oh, man, I just did, I just did this. Like, I'm doing good. And then man. you get a little, you do that, and you're like, oh, no, I just did that. And, oh, that's cool. But then after a certain point, you realize, like, bro, I need to be aiming way higher oh, than this. And, um, I had watched this doc years ago about, like, how Sweden producers, like, created, cultivated the pop landscape in America, right? And they got this saying in Sweden called John Tillakin. And it's basically, like, it don't matter what you did. You don't revel over accomplishments. Like, go. Yeah. You got to go do something. You got to yeah. go do something else. Because yeah. that shit behind you, you know? And that, that'd be the state that a nigga in and that flow. Like, nothing feel, nothing feel big enough or iconic enough for me. I know I could do more. So when I don't, it's like a disservice to my own being. Like, I'm really, I'm really leaving life empty. Mm-hmm. Like when yeah. I'm gone, I want to be like nigga. That nigga gave that like the doc gonna have to be so long because it's like this nigga gave everything. Yeah, yeah, I get. The, I mean, I get that sense just from just from this conversation. Um, speaking of uh, Kendrick and Cole, I, d- I definitely see you in that lane as well. I wanted to ask you some. You probably ain't never been asked this. Your swag. You you pretty much every time I see you on camera, you're dressed. Come on. The way you are now, hoodie, sweatpants. Right. You ain't got crocs. What is that? Yeah, right? them crocs. Oh, them crocs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the echo clocks. Uh, was there? To me, it's a minimalist type of aesthetic that is a kind of rejection of the materialism that you typically see in hip hop. Was that something intentional? Because usually people get to your level of success and they're iced out, which you might have yeah. in the tuck. I, I don't know. Iced out, designer brands, you know, all that, all the above. Was Is this something intentional where you're just like, I'm going to keep it minimal? Not even necessarily. Like, I like, you know, North Face coat this 800 something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I still like fly shit. I just like what I like. And I just don't... Some shit just don't make sense to me. It's like, nigga... You know, <laughs> I had a phase where... um, Like, I had I had bought a motorcycle and I bought my GT. And it was like... You know, I was feeling... You know, I didn't like that lane. Like, it's all fleeting. Once I got that shit repossessed and shit, it's like, mm-hmm. bro, none of this shit... None of this shit... None of it helps. Mm-hmm. None of it does nothing. And me, I just... I like to be on the go and I like to be comfortable. This is what I'm most comfortable in. I hate wearing jeans. I don't own a pair of jeans no more. Like, when I quit my job, I was like, I'll never wear jeans again. Do you own a suit? No. <laughs> Hell no. I don't... Do I? I don't even think I... Nigga, I know. <laughs> you feel me? Like, none of that... I don't even... I barely have tennis shoes. Uh, I got, like, two pairs of tennis shoes but when I hoop and run. But, you know, like... Yeah, that shit just don't really matter to me yeah. at, at all. I'm just not, a, I've never really been big in it. Like, I remember a time, I had a time 
like you know, younger of of that, and I got out of it real fast because I worked for my money. Like, and when you really like work to go get your paper, you just it's just it just builds a different energy. Yeah, and is yeah. that like I don't I don't have lucky money, uh, free money, you know, like. I really earn mine. Even when I go do a show, I really put on a show. So it's not like, oh, I just collected a bag. No, I had to do hella shit. I had to bring out my whole band. I had to get a bus for my peer. I had to get flights. I had to pull up, do rehearsal sound check. It ain't no free bag for me. Some niggas just pull up and I overfold, grab the mic, rap over their shit, and it's done. So it's like, I never had that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I think that's also something that's attracted such a, a wide variety of people in your audience. Is um, so it's it's relatable, right? Right. <laughs> I think a lot of rappers present themselves in ways that most of the people who listen to them they can't match that. You can never attain it. Yeah. You can never attain yeah. it. And some people are like, you know, maybe that's motivational, but I think some people it keeps them in a cycle of trying to live above their means. But I think with you, it just comes off as very down to earth. But I ain't gonna lie, when I first saw you, I was like, who, what, who is this dude? Right. Where, Crocs. I love it. <laughs> hey, you know what's so funny? I've made so people, so many people like come to love niggas being regular. Yeah. Because when I came in, I'm going viral and getting all this rapport. I'm on Breakfast Club Freestyle, no sway, no lineup, no hair, no nothing. And niggas wasn't used to seeing a regular nigga not wear that mask and play the the the, the rap star role. Yeah. I came as myself. I walked into church as myself. And I'm still finna give you the word. You know, and I, I, I man, I remember just comments. I go places and they like, man, you got to put... I remember I went to L.A. And one of the homies invited me to like the event. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm finna pull up with the homies. And he was like, oh, yeah, make sure you, you know, put this... And I was like... What you mean? <laughs> like, nigga, I don't have none. I'm just, I'm coming to, to chill. It's like, I can't, I can't come chill unless I'm dressed a certain, man, never. Never. It's like, that That shit ain't worth it to me. It, it don't make sense. You know, I'd rather be comfortable in who I am. If I can't enter the building like this, the way I woke up and came out of my house, my mama said, I'll be in my mama crib like this. Right. You know, like, what makes your establishment so much better? Right, And right. we humans. That shit just, it ain't, it ain't make no sense to me. So, yeah, I like it. I be chilling, and it's cost efficient. Mm-hmm. You know, these crocs, I got a shit ton of crocs. And it's mm-hmm. like, I love them. I mean, I think as an artist, the- the best thing you can do is to make yourself stand out. And it's interesting that by putting on the same designer brands that everybody wears or or, or whatever, you blend, in. you blend in. Whereas you being regular in this space actually makes you stand out. And I love it because the kids feel like I'm the home. Like, they, they look like, they be having no cry. They be like, can you sign my cry? You know, like, they can't get them Balenciaga boots these niggas be having on. Like, they'll know ne- you never go up to them and be like, oh, you know, like, it's just a different aspiration. Like, a kid who see me, it don't seem far-fetched to make it. Mm-hmm. It's like, damn, well, if that's, if that's making it and you can do that, bro, it don't seem far-fetched. It's just a, it's a, it's an easier concept to grasp and we needed it in hip-hop. I feel like it was a necessary change. We needed somebody to just be a regular nigga. Like, all of us don't wear chains and all of us don't drive raves and bands like, but every rap nigga who make it, that's the image we see consistently. I think it's well, I think it's much needed in the Bay too, because uh, I mean, our our music feel like it's boxed into two categories. Either you hella mm-hmm. street or you hella hip hop, like some hieroglyphic yeah. souls of mischief. Yeah. And I feel like I don't know if you're quite in between or just uh, you're kind of in your own own space, right? Uh, speaking of uh, J Cole, has he ever reached out to you, bro? No, but I just recently I was in L.A. at this shit, and uh, one of his artists uh, signed to Dreamville, Cos, came up and was like, "Man, Cole put me on your shit a while ago." He's like, "Man, this the blueprint," and I was like. Nigga, wow. <laughs> you that feel me? Because no, feeling. they didn't tap me. I can't wait to meet them, though, because I'll be like, nigga, why you ain't hit me? Just like y'all. <laughs> like, you know, I feel like 
And, and nobody has to, you know, nobody has to, but I, you know, uh, hey nigga, you doing that shit, that shit crazy, keep going. Goes a long way yeah. from, from your idols, you yeah. know, and from the people that you admire and see what you're doing. But you know, nobody owe you that shit, so I, I feel it too, but I'm yeah. ass. I'm still be like, nigga, why you, I could use that encouragement. No, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's another good thing about being an artist is managing your expectations from other people. Right. And, uh, cause man, I, I like the way you came at me. It's just like, let's do interviews. Like, sure. Oh, man, I get, I get some straight crybaby shit. My DMs sometimes, man. That's even... hilarious. Instead of just asking. Yeah. It's like, nigga, what do you want? Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, your story is not my responsibility. At man. all. I hate to tell you, bro. It'd be people I fuck with. Like, I would have loved to have them on the show, but then I'd be like, damn, you kind of on some weird Niggas, shit. Niggas, when you create a platform... Niggas instantly start to feel like you owe them because you're a service provider. Right. When I start doing my live sessions, I used to reach out, no responses, no nothing. Soon as shit start booming, it's like, oh, I got to get on. And it's like, oh, you acting funny now. It's like, hmm. Right. Yeah, I'm a comedian now. Right, right, right. You feel me? It's like, bro, no one owes you shit. And, I, and I'm the same way. Like, I know that's what I said with the coach. It's like, nigga don't owe me that. Right, that's just some right. shit I would like. But yeah. niggas will really approach you like, you like you have to do things for them. And it's crazy because it's like, you did all the work to build this shit. Well, what you just said about his artist said, who was it again? Kaz. Kaz. About Kaz saying that, that Cole put him on to you. You also never know who's watching. Right, you can't get. You might be angry at somebody for not fucking with you, but they might and actually. You be... know, with that is also like that's so to me. Hearing you just say it is funny because the first thing that came to my head is like that's even grander. He put a nigga on to me, yeah. like he didn't yeah. hit me and be like, "Go," oh, but he's putting niggas on to right. me, which which increases that. Like, Kaz had a lot of love for me through that put on, you know. Right. So shout out Cole, I fuck with you. <laughs> well, uh, to go back to your timeline a little bit, um, and you you mentioned this, uh, uh, one of the people that I was first to really reach out to you was Russ, right? Yeah. And yep. um, how did that go about? He just messaged you and tapped Yeah, in. we had uh, the freestyle, the 2021 freestyle went viral on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And he seen it. And yeah, he tapped in and was like, this shit hard. And around that time, I had just recently dropped the Field Effect 2. And so that was the first album he heard. And he was like, this shit is insane. And um, we just start building from there. And, you know, he start, uh, he was developing his label Diamond. And he's like, man, I'm trying to do some dope shit. You know, what? how can I help? What, what, is, what do you need? Does this work? Does this work? And we just start kind of working around. And we was able to establish a deal. Like, back then, that was uh, 2021. And I still ain't even delivered the album. I remember when we first started talking about the deal, I was like, I'm going to give you this project, but let me build my shit first, indie. Like, let me just release everything. I'm going to get myself. I told him, I'm going to get myself to a million followers. Then we'll drop the album so you can start off in the green. We ain't even got to worry about none of that extra shit. And I literally did it. And I still ain't dropped the album. And we talk ever so often. And just, it's so dope. He got so much love. For me and what I'm building, like, it was the greatest thing that could happen to me because it was a deal, but not in the form of a traditional deal. It was really just an angel investment. Mm. <laughs> um, I think that makes sense. He He's another person that kind of strikes me as being in that lane of, like, regular guy <laughs> rap. Right. Where he's not putting on too much. He's a very minimalist. Yep. I mean, he'd be flossing too, but um, just successful independently. So it, it kind of makes sense that y'all would, Man, bro, it makes all the sense. And when it happens, it's going to be such a special moment because it's like, yeah, the indie niggas did it. Yeah. And this is possible. And it and it does work. And we shared the blueprint the whole way. Me and Russ, shit, I love when I go online, I see Russ doing the shit we do now because I'll I come over some shit and be like, nigga, this is out. And he hit me like, oh, bro, you got to, you know, and it's so dope because we share that information and, it works. We lay the blueprint for the world to witness and experience, and it don't just work in music. It works in any field and process if you put that work in. Well, that, that was also just a big uh, step up for you, right, in terms of getting vi more visibility on you, right, and more people outside of the Bay and uh, learning about you, correct? Yes. Yeah. Can't not... I don't know if a lot of niggas know me from Russ. Okay. You know, from the Russ situation, like, do you know about the Russ shit through me or through him? Uh, I know, 
Good you point. know it through yeah. me, yeah. right? A lot of people know of that mm. through me. They mm. don't really know it through him. So it, um, like I said, he he came to Berkeley and did a show, and I did that show, and like he always allowed me opportunity, but it's not in a way to where you know. Like he did a Breakfast Club interview saying it, but even then, it's like you don't know me through Russ. You may know Russ through me. <laughs> you feel me? I think this is something that is also kind of refreshing in, in hearing when I talk to you because a lot of artists, even when they're successful, feel like they make the mistake of trying to attach themselves to somebody who's bigger than them, so to speak, instead of doing what you're saying, like, nah, let me let me focus on my Man, own Man, I, I wanted the complete opposite because I never wanted anybody to discredit all the work, me, my family, my daughter's my mind. I never wanted anyone to discredit what we did. And mm-hmm. and that's why I share it. Like, bro, early in that phase is I was hella hesitant on even doing the deal or even talking about the deal because I didn't want a nigga to be like, oh, yeah, he made it, but he had Russ. It's like, no, nigga, Russ invested in me. He gave me a sum of money that, nigga, that shit bit. I was already making money and investing money. He, he Angel invested into me and I had to do all the work to go get it. You don't see Russ posting me every day. You don't see me right. on this flight. You right. don't see none of that shit. Right. I, I don't, we don't have a song. I'm not in a music video. You feel me? Like, None of that shit exists. This was all off my muscle and my work and my thoughts and my team. So I was hesitant on the other end. I never wanted to attach myself to nothing because it's like, bro, I, I built this shit. I don't want that credit taken from me and given to nobody. Well, I think that's another thing that you've become kind of famous for is turning down deals. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm looking in, the, I did my research because, again, I, you've done a lot of interviews. I'm trying to... Um, Talk about stuff that we that you haven't really touched on, and like every interview I see is like La Russell on turning down deals. Yeah. La Russell on turning down. They deals. love to put them cap. <laughs> it, it'd be so funny because it'd be about hella shit, and that'd be right. the title. It was right, like nigga, right, right, right. right. Um, but recently, um, you mentioned Def Jam, Def Jam, and yeah. I, I, I saw an article written by uh, Kayla Wood. Shout out to Kayla. That's my Wood. dog. Yeah, um, she had actually interviewed me about. So article she was writing about you before. Wow. She didn't put me in she was the, on, the article. Oh, no. It's, cool. it's, it's longer. It's coming. <laughs> oh, is it's that coming. right? Okay. It's, okay. it's some okay. big shit. Okay. okay. Um, well, she wrote an article about uh, for KQED about um, the, that Def Jam, Def Jam yep. had offered you something, right? Yeah. And um, I'm sorry. I don't recall how that panned out. Did that come into fruition? No. <laughs> it was another, another path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was another path. And this was the second time. So, you know, who, who knows? The second time back. that Def Jam had came in. Had you. made an offer, yep. Um, and, um, yeah, each time we get more familiar with each other won't and what, but, yeah, the I just don't know if the system works for me. And I've been trying to figure out a way to be able to get the amenities of the system and, like, trial it but also keep my autonomy. And that's what I've had to explain to them. And we just can't find terms that make sense because it's like, I want to give y'all a shot. You know, I would love to be a nigga who bring back a label and had that research. And it's like, no, nah, nigga, like Def Jam is iconic. I really wanted that. But we just can't find a way to make it work first. You, you know, I ultimately, I have to have my autonomy and my independence. I need to be able to do what I want. We always get in these situations where a nigga wants you to come into their system, and when you come in there, you have to alter the way you do things, deliver things, all the shit. And I'm all, I'm like, no, I'm running. I'm already doing everything. Come in and figure out how you could fill it in and do the shit that you need to do. I'm giving you content. I'm giving you interview jams. I'm giving you live performances pieces. I'm giving you shows. I'm giving you meeting. I'm meeting Andre. I'm giving you everything you fucking need. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, run with me. And um, it's been hard to find someone who who's just open to letting us do that and filling in the gaps around it instead of just bringing you into the structure and all oh, this album did, and then you release a single and it's like, that's not my flow. I don't want to work like that. That don't work for me. I want to do what I'm already doing that made me successful. I just want to do it at a bigger degree. So yeah, we couldn't work it, but uh, I just recently started working with Venice. Venice is uh, owned by Troy Carter. Big music guy, Indian, I feel like we finna really do some damage because we just had a long conversation yesterday, the same talk, like, 
I fuck with, I love what y'all doing, but I'm at this point now where I need to run. And I need you to just, I understand that I, I may not get all the amenities someone would get that gives you a six month rollout and out, but I'm willing to get what I will get. There's no way I can get less with us working together with all the resource and access you have and all the resource access I have. I give everything an artist needs to succeed. The only difference is like, usually when someone has an interview jam like this and it goes viral, the, it get posted, it'll go, and then the label will seed it everywhere. So you'll start seeing it on this channel, this channel, this channel, right? That's what the label usually does. So now I just hired a marketing agency to handle my seed, and then I got yeah, a seed man. guy to, yeah. so we can start yeah. doing all the same things, but right. do it with our own autonomy. But, you know, if I could find a label that makes sense and, and willing to cut the right check and is like, go, I would love to. I would love to use day paper and use day infrastructure, but it just... And I'm the easiest bet. That's the craziest shit. It's like, if we got to bet, if we got to bring anyone in and bet on them to succeed in the next three years based on where they are now, I'm the easiest fucking bet to make. I'm probably one of the few niggas who's out right now who's going to be around, you know, in the next 10 years. Mm. Wow. So the issue is you, do, you are doing so much on your own with your own team that there's not much left to offer. And also, when you say um, uh, autonomy, are you talking ownership, like masters and, and that type of thing, publishing? Um, definitely. When I say autonomy, I'm talking in terms of like, I propose to Def Jam. I'm like, I'll do a deal with you for X amount of songs, but I need to have the autonomy to release independently outside of this so uh, y'all don't slow me down. Yeah. That way I can give y'all these songs, but while y'all doing all the things you need to do to make them work, I'm going to go release my regular shit so I keep my motion going. Uh, and they were like, we're open to that, but then you would have to use our indie distributor. And it's like, why the fuck would I do that? If I'm not happy with what y'all doing on that side, but I still got to deal with y'all on this side, how does the fuck, does that make any sense for me? You yeah. feel me? Like, it just... They don't fully understand. It's like, I'm not trying to come in y'all system and do it y'all way. Y'all way don't look great to me. I, I, You know, like, it's working occasionally, but what I'm doing is already working. Just amplify what I'm doing. We don't need to come changing the structure, none of that shit. I can see why that's kind of uh, stalemating your negotiations, because that is, uh, that's like a different language. And be, every time people. we propose a deal, I get the deal memo back. And it's just so much shit that was like, where the fuck this come from? That ain't got nothing to do yeah, with what, yeah, what yeah, I yeah. wanted. Like, yeah. you know, I did. I just recently did a deal with Live Nation. An incredible deal. First of its kind. <laughs> but like, so, some incredible shit. Um, and the deal was... There was nothing in there that I ain't, I ain't mentioned to the lawyer or agree with. There was, there was nothing in there that wasn't in the terms that I sent... It was like, so wow, this is possible. So niggas just playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Uh, I mean, I think what I'm hearing you say is like, and what I, I kind of envision for you, bro, is getting to this, I don't know if this is the right term, but like almost like a superstar type of, you're looking to maybe be an arena selling artist, arena touring artist at one point. Bro, I'm finna sell out Oracle in the next... Three years max. Yeah. 2020, 2026. Yeah. I'm going to do the first offer-based Oracle show at an arena. Like, it's already mapped. Mm -hmm. That's already my lineage. Like, you know, I'm... That's already the lineage for me. I mean, you're you're talking... This is, this is when it gets bigger than Bay Area hip-hop and you're going into, <laughs> like, Metallica and Taylor Swift and uh, Michael Jackson, uh, that U2, like, rock star mm -hmm. levels. The difference is that has yet to be accomplished by independent artists. So do you feel like... Russ. Russ has done that? Mm. Yeah, Brent Fires. It's a couple of us. Okay. Yeah, it's a couple of us. Okay, okay. We, we, could, we, could, we could argue... A little bit on the scale of that, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Because right. when you talk about like a like a, like a Metallica concert at mm -hmm. their heyday, like that shit's different. That's yeah. fucking nuts. Um, and it's common. Yeah, yeah. So you do you feel like um, yourself and these other independent artists are going to break that barrier, or do you feel like 
at some point, you're going to need uh, the majors to come in and, and help you get there. I don't think I'll ever need the majors. Mm. I don't need them now, and I never will. Desire and need are two different things. I think they could be very helpful if they come in a line properly. It's like, yeah, then we could all make this something that never happened before incredible. But I, I never needed them, and I never will. You know, I, I have the right partner. Troy Carter is one... I got the partners, you know, but it's like, yeah, if we could find a label that makes sense and aligns and wants to help, who wouldn't want to make this happen? We've never seen it before, and we have seen it in a very long time. And I feel like that's where it's going for me unless I decide I don't want it no more. Goddamn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've, I, in, my, in my work, right, I deal with a lot of stories of, oh, we could have had that deal, but we fucked it up. Or like, we're supposed to sign with them, but then this happened. I've never heard somebody say what you're saying in the way you're saying. I've heard of people turning down deals because they're independent and they're... You know, sometimes, I, sometimes I've had to sit with myself a few times and be like, damn. And I had a convo with my niggas like, am I indie to a fault? Like, should I have taken that Rock Nation deal? That's would, been I be, a Bay Area, would I be uh, way uh, different in a different position? But it's like... No, bro. Yeah. I was supposed to. I was supposed to be this because I still got here. Yeah. You know, on every label, every label that courted me is niggas on a label who got signed when I was in there getting courted or before who ain't got where La Russell got. Mm. It, you know, so it's like I was never supposed to. This was always my path and my route. But I had those thoughts a few times. Like, damn, I would already been. But it's like I don't even want those results. And every time I get in that space where I'm like. Oh, I should be there. And then it's sinking. It's like, nigga, I don't even want to be. That's not even some shit I actually want. It's some shit that it's like when you're a kid and you see a nigga playing with a certain toy and like kids reacting to it. It's like, you don't even give a fuck about that shit. You want it because yeah. they got it. Yeah. You know? And when, when I start with that realization, it's like, bro, my path, the thing that's going to make my shit so much crazier is the fact that it is so different. Once I start doing what everybody else did, oh, they signed it. Once I start doing that, it it invalidates everything that is unique about La Russell's journey. Yeah, because I noticed with your fan fan base too, that's one of the reasons they're so invested in you because they're like, oh, he, I can name my own price for this. This is going directly to him. This is our guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you? I read. I also read in that in Kayla's article that uh, Good Company is a a five hundred one c three nonprofit. Mm. So a label deal, um, as in terms of signing Good Company as a label, is is not uh, really an option. It's in LLC as well. Oh, okay. We got two different. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, I was gonna ask, um, and you mentioned it already. I'm sorry, what was the young lady you, you mentioned earlier? Shantae. Shantae. Are you, is part of your plan in, uh, down the line or currently um, developing other artists? And, and That's what I've been doing for okay. the past. See, I've been writing songs for mm. artists. I don't know what their content put out. Every, every time I meet somebody I love, and my intention is never to sign anyone. We just split pie. Where mm. I help them release, show them they shit, give me my royalties and my percent, give me my pub for writing and do yours and keep going. I never want to be committed or have to do that for anyone. I always want to do it out of my own leisure and my will. But I'm building Motown. Like, that's that's what I'm on. I feel like in terms of what's next in music, I'm cultivating that shit. Shantae is going to be gigantic. Jane Hancock, Mally. I got a Poozy. I got a bunch of talent around me that I just... I know how to cultivate. And when I see something special, I bring it into my unit and show the game and move. And that's what I'm on. Like, I don't ever want to sign an artist. I just want to help. And mm -hmm. that's where we're going to win. But I, we, we build the Motown. And that is a grand goal of mine, to get a partner where it's like a partner that that cash money shit, where yeah. it's like, nigga, go do it. Go do it. Bring it to us when it's done. We're going to do what we do best. That's yeah. all I'm seeking. It's like, I don't... You know, I had to remind myself that I'm not ever requesting nothing that's irrational. I'm asking to own the shit that I made in my home that came out of my mind, and I'm asking to have the autonomy to release it at the pace that I wish to. The split, we could always work out based on the amount. 
I'm not asking for anything irrational. I just want a partner that gets it and makes sense and is like, yeah, keep doing you because that worked and let us figure it out. But everybody wants you to come in and mold to what they doing to make their job easier because this is what they used to doing. But it's like, no, nigga, La Russell's here. That shit don't work for me. It don't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I think your your brand is like a, being a disruptor. The industry disruptor. Yeah. It, 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 you know, you're familiar with that term right. of business, right. right? Is when something new comes along that changes the way business is done or the way that products are consumed. And I feel like uh, you've you've been doing that, man, these last few years. Uh, one conversation that comes up a lot on social media or in certain spaces is what is the Bay Area missing right now? What does the Bay Area need to become one of these I mean I, I, I'm i one of the biggest supporters of the Bay out there but in terms of being a hub like in Atlanta or mm. uh, New York or LA an industry hub um, or just to you know have more of us uh, reach these higher levels what do you think is missing in the Bay Area to help us get to that point of success in the industry? Infrastructure. Um, infrastructure and cultivation. And infrastructure all the way vertically integrated. Like, you have to replicate the label system to do it successfully independent. Or you have to find new ways to do it. So, when I say infrastructure, it's like, I find an artist, like I find a Shantae. And I know everything I need to do to get people to hear and find out about her. Right? Like, and I'm willing to do that and pour into her and I'm willing to invest and fund it without um, nothing has been able to prevent me from doing that. Versus here, you know, like I had early empire interest and it's like, oh, we fuck with you and we want to help. But as soon as the deal don't align or make sense, all that help, like, where does it go? Like, I never, I never not help when I can help. You feel me? Yeah. But some people, if it's not in their favor or if it doesn't align with what, they just won't help you. And it's like, damn, I thought we was, we was about to, I thought, you know, like, for me, any nigga who I love coming out the Bay, seeing a rapper, I've embraced and i getting given everything I opportunity to come do this show, come, you know? And, um, and, this is not a knock because I got I got a deep love for Ghazi and what he built sure. and what he established. Like, man, nothing but reverence. But it's also like some shit don't be making no sense, you know? And some shit just don't be making no sense. And it be hurtful sometimes because, man, bro, we just need more infrastructure. But I'm really grateful for the infrastructure that they established and they provided for the Bay. But we need it... Um, we need it to look a little different for the future to really cultivate and get out of here what we need and what's necessary. So it's like, it takes it take so much. It takes all of us rallying up. Like, we really, the shit that come out that's like, bro, this it, we got to really rally up and get behind. When you hear something that's a gem and that's special, it shouldn't, we got to really rally up and get behind. And that's what I did when I was doing the live sessions. Every art that came, all right, come, come, I'm a, Man, we had so many viral pieces. Niggas was getting deals and getting syncs in. It's like we need to all rally up without having to get something in return all the time, right? Without having a... A deal should never stop you from helping a nigga that you feel like could be impactful or is special to the re or mean something. Ain't nothing should ever stop that. Ever. Yeah, what, what I'm hearing in your response <clears throat> is what you were getting at earlier about the war. You can either conquer or you can embrace. And I think what you're saying and what you've done is an example of embracing other people and, and for lack of a better word, not being chimmy with shit, right? And uh, I think a big part of what's wrong in the Bay, even infrastructure-wise, is the ego of what do I get out of this as opposed to let me just offer some help just on the strength that this is dope and I'm in a Man. position to, to be able to help. And I think even, you know... Niggas will start mentioning their bottom line. Right, right. <laughs> it's it, like, yeah, there's a price tag attached to it. Niggas, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and I think even when I, when I talk about um, the angry rappers in my DMs, there, there's, there's mm -hmm. ego there too. Anytime someone makes a list, 
These are the best rappers in the Bay and, Area right now. How come I ain't on there? Right? How come so and so on there? And ego on all ends. Like I'm, I'm the same. I'm guilty of being egoic in situations where it just couldn't make sense in a line for me. Like it's on all ends. That's why it's like it's a everybody thing. Like that infrastructure that we lack is just. Man, I'm building it. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm doing my best to build it because we just don't... We have all the ability. We just don't know how to... Man, it's so much. It's so much you got to do. And there needs to be a place that you can go and get that embrace organically and naturally and in a real way. And that's why I love that there is a Thizzler in the Empire in a good company because they're all for different types of forms of art because I believe no matter what form of art you're making, there should be a place for you to cultivate that. But right. currently, there's not. Right. If right. you, a certain kind of artist, there's not a place for you to get cultivated and get the same resource that you may get if you're talking about killing your niggas and right. killing people. You know, it's like, it's a different access that niggas grant you, which is crazy because it's like, I always look at it like if you got a million dollars to spend on anything and you have two things that will work with this million dollar spend, I got to look at you based on what you chose to put that into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some shit just, yeah, yeah. Uh, it don't be making sense. And it, it really takes a group effort, bro. Everybody got to, our OGs got to really embrace niggas. Like we have to, bro, we really got to stop going in with like, I got to get something out of this shit to help somebody. Like, yeah. bro, I had Spice One in the backyard. I, I paid Spice One to come to the mm. to the thing and rap. Like, I hit him and like, come rap. And it's like, I'll fuck with your feet. I just want you to come rap. Just, it's going to be, it's going to end up in your benefit. I just want <laughs> right. to see you get this clip and do your thing. Like, it's going to already know what it's going to lead. Too, right? Already know that. Yeah. I spent my money on the yeah. ads and the seat. And it's uh. like, because I already know. Uh. I, I'm... Ain't nothing gonna stop me from doing that. It's Wait, like, even another, if you another, don't see the another vision. Another artist could have been like, oh, what, you gonna charge me for this? Well, fuck it then. We ain't doing it. I don't give a fuck. I could have easily been like, what you mean? You know, but I never had that approach. Mm -hmm. I never had that approach. I've been there as like, I'm not gonna even do a nigga how they did me. Because mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do me like that. God damn. <laughs> We're going to have to run this back, man, because yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could stay here for like right. three hours. This was a good game. one. You like this one? This was a right good on, one. Right on, man. Yeah, hopefully we get, we get some of these viral clips out of this. For man. certain. <laughs> for certain. For certain. Nah, but, um, you know, uh, I, like I said, I've been an admirer of your work. It's undeniable. You you can't help but to notice what you're doing. Um, but I gained a new level of respect for it just hearing you uh, expand on some of these topics. Gratitude, and, and, man. And getting to have this conversation. So once again, thank you for reaching out, brother. Um, as I always say to all our guests, man, if we if you ever need our support with anything, we are one message away. And come we'll, on, we'll love to have you back. Y'all gotta come to a backyard show. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Just do, do you know, do mm -hmm. a do a history, do, do a little, give us a little piece. I'll give you a little workshop or something. Yeah, like that. give yeah, us a little yeah, piece, yeah. man. Do Let's do it, man. Right? <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you everybody for watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, showing support. Go, go. You got anything you want to promote right now? Life. Okay, yeah. Just follow me, this, you, man. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shout out to LaRussell, man. Shout out to the whole team. Shout out to you for watching. This is Dregs One, History of the Bay Podcast. And we you heard. Here. Peace. Wow. That hey. was a good one. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the bank. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the bank.